Hey everybody, Dr. Wenzel with Brentwood MD. I wanted to make this quick video for you to dive into a conversation that I have weekly with my private clients. Um, and when I say weekly, uh, I probably should say actually daily. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a single day in any given week where I'm not having at least once uh, a conversation about alcohol intake and its contribution to one's overall health journey. And uh, most people are drastically underestimating its impact. Uh, I know certainly I have historically and am now just starting to fully understand and realize and appreciate its overall impact in my own journey. Um, I went on a journey uh, losing 40 pounds of fat uh, over the course of two years through intense, intense uh, commitment to to making some radical changes in my diet, to reintroducing uh, strength training um, in a way that, that has been truly life-changing. But yet, in my own journey, I hit a wall, and the last thing for me to let go was alcohol. Um, and look, I've never been a heavy drinker, but the fact that I was consuming more days than not, I finally got to the place where I had eliminated everything else I had tightened up everything else and alcohol was the thing <clears throat> that was the last straw. It was the thing that needed to happen in order for me to unleash my full biochemical potential in order to feel great, mobilize fat, be lean, be strong. Uh, and I find that many people who consume alcohol and also have health ambitions with no exception that I can think of, are dramatically underestimating its impact. In today's video, I really just want to kind of give you a bird's eye view of how complicated this really is. And so this is about underestimating the impact of alcohol. And when we look at <clears throat> why someone would drink, uh, I know very few people who drink with any frequency because they already feel great. The overwhelming majority of people who consume alcohol, it's to help unwind or, um, you know, celebrate the end of a day or it's, it's hard to deal with the stress at the end of the day. It's, it, it, it's usually a mechanism to take you out of a less ideal place and bring you into a more relaxed ideal place. And that's represented by this frowny face and then alcohol gets us to this happy place. So. For the most part, people consume alcohol <clears throat> in order to get the net effect on the brain. And the things that affect our brain that give us the things that we're pursuing are the stimulation of the GABA pathway and the dopamine pathway. And, you know, again, this is not a biochemistry lecture, but GABA is uh, a pathway that is a net suppressive in our nervous system. And it uh, is an anxiolytic. It helps us slow down and <clears throat> it works. Uh, alcohol works. That's why people drink it. The other thing is dopamine. Dopamine is our uh, pleasure uh, center. It is the thing that is released when we find somebody we care about, when we uh, get a raise. It is the sex and chocolate. It is the, it is the hormone in and around uh, positive experiences and can be very, 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 um, a, a very strong driver towards pursuing things that are pleasurable. It's kind of that pleasure hormone. And so we're, we're pursuing alcohol to get this net effect in our brain. The challenge is we have all this that we have to get through in order to appreciate this. This is happening at the same time and oftentimes long term downstream after we've already experienced this and received that benefit and it's gone, we're still paying the price. And I start with a, this is a gross oversimplification of uh, nutritional biochemistry, but it is something deep in my core and anybody who spent any time with me knows that I preach from this pulpit very often and uh, you know, essentially, we can look at most of at least macro 
uh, nutrition, not micronutrition, but macronutrition. In other words, the things that we consume that give us energy. And there are three primary sources of macronutrients. There are protein, fats, and carbs. And each of them, once they pass our lips, have three distinct pathways that they go down in order to <coughs> uh, fulfill the design, sort of speak. Uh, you know, protein comes in, turns into amino acids. Amino acids go to tissue repair and growth. A small percentage of amino acids will be kicked off and form glucose. Fats, when we eat fats, uh, don't stay as fat. They get broken down into the basic building block, which is a triglyceride. These triglycerides, depending on the environment that it's in, will either go to a ketone or it will get transported to be stored in long-term storage in the adipocyte or the fat cell. Carbohydrates, when we eat, get broken down to their basic sugar component, plus or minus fiber. And again, depending on the hormonal environment, namely insulin, if insulin is present, you're going to be driving excess sugars into triglycerides and uh, also be driving a small percentage of sugars, if needed, into forming of glycogen uh, to the brain for energy and for skeletal muscle to, to utilize that glucose for energy. The challenge with ethanol or alcohol is that when alcohol comes into our nutritional equation, there's nowhere for it to go. And, you know, this is probably not new to you. This is the term empty calories. This is, there are calories associated with the potential energy that lives within alcohol. The problem is we don't have a mechanism to process these calories to actually extract the potential out of them. They just remain potential. Uh, and as the body does with all foreign substances, if we don't have a way to metabolize them in some way that serves our greater need, which is to stay alive, um, either in the short term or the long term, we process things as toxins and we get out, we get, we got, got to get rid of them. And so alcohol comes in with their calories and we don't have a pathway for them. So they get diverted to the liver. The liver is responsible for detoxifying the alcohol that we ingest. There's a lot of talk in the fitness world around, you know, all calories are created equal and that it's just, a, a, it's just math, which that's not the, the purpose of this conversation. That's a separate rant. Um, but all calories are not created equal. Listen, I, I mean, a, a calorie of broccoli and a calorie of M&M and a calorie from alcohol, they all do unique and profoundly different things biochemically once they pass your mouth. They, they don't just automatically go into one bucket and get processed all the same way. That is just, it's, it's ludicrous. It's nutritional heresy, but yet it is a, still a very well documented and tightly held to religion in the fitness world. Um, and so, yes, there are some empty calories. In other words, calories that we can't actually use uh, and calories in excess do stimulate uh, fat production, but honestly, that's one of the smallest impacts that alcohol has on your overall health journey. Not insignificant, it's just not the number one thing. So while we have alcohol calories that are one thing, we also have the sugary mixers, and I think there are a lot of people who are starting to understand that these empty calories on the back end of very sugary things can also be like a double whammy, but even that is a, as a tertiary thing. The primary issue above and beyond the macros is that alcohol being diverted to the liver to be processed as a toxin has a dramatic impact on the physiology at the level of the liver. Specifically, and this is again a gross oversimplification, the liver probably, other than the brain, probably the most complex organ in our body and uh, one of the busiest organs. Um, it has an incredible list of responsibilities. But for the sake of this video, I really want to stress three things that it does that are directly inhibited by alcohol. And that is these three. And those three, because I don't know if you can read them, are basically cholesterol synthesis, so the, the liver makes cholesterol, as does every cell in the body, but the liver also makes cholesterol. The cholesterol reuptake process, so in other words, all the cholesterol that's floating around your body, our liver actually has receptors within the liver to extract them, 
to keep good homeostasis, and triglyceride synthesis. So all of your fat and cholesterol metabolism at the level of the liver is completely shut down. It's completely shut down. If there's alcohol present, the alcohol diverts all attention to processing the toxin and not what it's designed to do. It's kind of like, it's kind of like the troublemaker in a class when you have a, uh, a substitute teacher. They run distraction while the rest of the class can just run amok. It is, as long as that kid is distracting the teacher, everybody behind him can do whatever they want in complete disarray. And biochemically, that's about what happens in the presence of alcohol. So if you're consuming alcohol, you're net suppressing your fat metabolism. If you happen to be consuming alcohol and also the other foods that you're eating, and if it happens to be very fatty, very sugary foods, all of that is in dysregulation. And what we tend to see in alcohol consumption on a regular basis is an elevation of uh, sugars, an elevation of triglycerides. Uh, we start to see fatty deposition within the liver. Um, this is a big, big, big problem. Back to the brain, by the time we have enjoyed the benefits, the reason that we drank in the first place, we have this positive effect on the GABA pathway. We have a positive effect on the dopaminergic pathway. So these are the pleasure and slowdown. This is the reason we're drinking. Like this whole, this is it. This is the reason. But we also have a net suppressive effect on our cerebral cortex. That's our executive function. That's our decision making. That's our uh, ability to execute decisions uh, in life that are in our best interest. And uh, this is where regret. Uh, I wasn't thinking that, that term. Uh, well, alcohol suppresses your frontal cortex. We also have a suppressive effect in the hypothalamus. This is a performance uh, center. So uh, physically, you wouldn't be very good at ru one, running wind sprints, uh, and you're not very good in the bedroom. Hypothalamus uh, suppression uh, really is uh, a negative impact. Uh, and the last thing is your cerebellum. This is the back of our brain. This is where we uh, have our balance center. This is why you do the toe to line. And you know, we, d we lose our ability to perceive our, um, our spatial awareness and our balance. And so again, listen, I'm a normal guy. Like I like tequila, I like bourbon. But as I'm navigating my own journey, I'm having to ask myself, why am I drinking? What's the goal? And does that goal supersede any physical or health goal that I am actively pursuing? And it won't all the time not be worth it, but we really need to start auditing our alcohol intake if we have ambition to eliminate more visceral fat, to improve our sleep, improve our sex life, improve our overall physiology. Alcohol cannot be worth it in the meantime. Uh, it just can't be worth it all the time. And so I, I hope this can help, you can help see this. Um, and again, like I did everything else right. I promise you, I've been down this journey and maybe you're watching this and you're like, could it really be, could it really just be that the last thing to go is the alcohol, that it could be that impactful, I dare you to try. I dare you to try and measure it. And what I am certain you will find is that you're underestimating it as well. Listen, I hope this video was useful for you. Um, please share it if you like it, leave comments. Uh, if you have questions, I'll be in the comments. And um, I hope you uh, are doing well. Go get them.